Hello, and happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to, to the State of 911 webinar series hosted by the National 911 Program. My name is Sherry, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar series is designed to provide useful information for the 911 stakeholder community about federal and state participation in the planning, design, and implementation of next generation 911 systems, or NG911. It includes real life experiences from leaders overseeing these transitions throughout the country. Today's session will feature presenters from the FCC's Task Force on Optimal PSAP Architecture, otherwise known as TFOPA, and the NG911 Interstate Playbook. Mr. Tim May of the FCC's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Mr. Steve Souter, former director of the Fairfax County, Virginia Department of Public Safety and the TFOPA Task Force Chair, will provide a summary of the task force's key findings and recommendations. Ms. Dana Wahlberg, the 911 program manager for the State of Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and Mr. Jason Horning, NG911 program manager at the North Dakota Association of Counties, will discuss the successes and challenges states and regions face when interconnecting their ESI nets as they transition to full NG911. For more information on future National 911 program webinars or to access archived recordings or learn more about the National 911 program, please visit 911.gov. Feedback or questions about the webinars can be sent to national 911 team at mcp911.com. If you are experiencing any difficulty with the WebEx application, please call WebEx Technical Assistance at 866-229-3239 and select option 1. Please note that all participants' phone lines today have been put in a listen-only mode and this webinar is being recorded. To ask questions of our presenters, feel free to take one of two actions. Using WebEx's chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, enter your question at any time during the presentation, and it will be entered into our queue. This feature is not visible while your screen is in the fully expanded page view. Or to ask your question live, use the raise hand feature to request your phone line to be unmuted and you will be called upon to ask your question. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Lori Flaherty, coordinator for the National 911 program. Lori, please go ahead. Thanks, Sherry. I'm really uh, grateful to have the four people on our webinar that we have today. Uh, so let me introduce the first two without further ado. As Sherry mentioned, Tim May is with the Policy and Licensing Division of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission. That's where he works, but you know, frankly, Tim has been a trusted colleague and a good friend for years. He's one of the smartest guys I know, and he's been a tireless advocate for us on 911 issues at the FCC. Steve Souter, as Sherry mentioned until very recently, was the director of the Fairfax County PSAP. But if you know the name Steve Souter, you know he sort of doesn't need an introduction. He's been in public safety longer than most of you have been alive. Um, and he, frankly, is you know one of the godfathers of 911. So FCC was lucky to get him as the chair of this task force. And um, you know we've been lucky to have him for so many years in public safety. So the floor is yours, gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Lori, and thank you, Sherry, for that very kind introduction. Um, we have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to jump right into it, and I'm going to go through a couple of slides, and then I'm going to turn uh, things over to Steve. Um, so the Task Force on Optimal PSAP Architecture uh, chartered in late December 2014 and was created specifically to focus on optimal PSAP system and network configuration in terms of emergency communications efficiency, performance, and operations functionality. The task force was chaired throughout its life by Steve Satter, who is with me today, and also co-chaired by uh, Dana Wahlberg, who is actually presenting in the next half hour. Um, in order to focus the task force and really drive some near-term results and recommendations, the commission created three working groups. 
Working Group 1 focused on cybersecurity and was chaired by Jay English, uh, who was representing APCO. Jay was the Director of Communications of the Communications Center and 911 Services for APCO, and he is now serving as Public Safety Program Manager for the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center at DHS. I think, therefore, we should pay close attention to this particular report. Uh, working Group 2 focused on NG911 architecture implementation and was chaired by David Hall, who's Public Safety Director for the Lower Allen Township of Pennsylvania. Uh, working Group 3 focused on optimal resource allocation and including real assessments of fee-based funding, uh, real-world assessments of fee-based funding of the nation's 911 system. That working group benefited from the stewardship first of Washington State Utilities and Transportation Commissioner Phil Jones, and then Jim Gerke, CEO of the Texas 911 Alliance, picked up for the bulk of 2016. So what were the two key deliverables that the task force delivered? Well, first, in early, early 2016, the task force, after a very hard year of uh, concerted effort, produced the consolidated report and recommendations. And really, this is a detailed guidance and set of recommendations that can help accelerate any state or local jurisdiction's transition to NG911. It's a valuable blueprint for some of the key actions that are needed to put NG911 transition back on track. Um, it provides guidance for bringing the latest in technological innovation into the PSAP. Uh, it, it scopes out the methods to effectively and efficiently protect PSAPs against the real and expanding threat of cyber attack. Um, in, in particular, it, it showed why cybersecurity or how cybersecurity in the NG911 environment needs to be address, addressed by PSAPs collectively rather than individually. And third, the recommendations for further study of innovative funding models enable, to enable state and local authorities to pay for the transition while also preventing scarce 911 funds from being diverted to other programs. So this is really the foundational document. It's available on the Commission's website. Um, but we weren't done with the task force, and so for 2016, we gave them some discrete tasks which were really designed to drill down further and develop actionable inf recommendations and guidance for stakeholders and decision makers, and those are the ones we're going to focus on today. So in December, really three supplemental reports, as we call them, were adopted. Um, the first one covers the, the so-called EC3 concept. This is an additional PSAP security layer for data management, inspection, and filtering. Um, there's also the funding sustainment model that Jim Gerke's group put together. Um, this is something used by state and 911 authorities to calculate their financial needs to support a transitional NG911 implementation. Um, and then third, there's the NG911 readiness scorecard. This is the guidance document for authorities planning their transition to NG911. Now, I'm going to cover the first two of these items, and Steve will walk you through the, the readiness scorecard. So let's jump to the next slide. So the EC3 concept. So the working group determined that the future NG911 architecture that the task force was developing required an additional element, which it dubbed the Emergency Communications Cybersecurity Center, or EC3, to create a centralized function and location for securing NG networks and systems. Now, this cooperative platform includes core cybersecurity services, interconnected monitoring and mitigation, and near real-time information sharing amongst multiple levels of public safety uh, agencies and entities. Um, you know, the, the concept really is intended to empower federal, state, local, tribal, and, and territorial PSAPs and authorities, 911 authorities, by providing you know, these cooperative options to defend both common areas of interest and individual networks and systems. In particular, the establishment of shared core services can be utilized by multiple participating agencies. And this could definitely lead to substantial cost savings and could also decrease the time needed to implement a comprehensive cybersecurity system. So if we look at the, uh, the diagram here, you know, th this, this is sort of the, the, the broad overview, but the potential flow of this system would, it would begin with the originating service provider on the left side, and you have your NG911 core service elements, which encompass the, the ESINET transport network within and between disparate PSAPs. So it, it would provide for monitoring of call statistics, system health, anomaly detection, data sharing, mitigation and recovery while still allowing local agencies to maintain local control of day-to-day -day operations within their specific PSAPs. So rather than requiring PSAPs to build and staff such facilities, the EC3 concept allows for PSAPs from within and across jurisdictions to interconnect to the core cybersecurity system and benefit from its capabilities, whether they're federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial. 
you know, and this, this architecture is intended to represent a scalable and customizable approach such that any EC3 can interconnect with other EC3s throughout the United States with the same functions, requirements, and failover capacity as addressed in more detail in the first report. And again, I'm going to keep referring to the first report and the supplemental reports. Uh, your assignment in general though, is to read all of these documents. Um, I do want to say a quick word about identity, credentialing, and access management, or ICAM. Now this refers to the intersections of digital identities and associated attributes, credentials, and access controls into one comprehensive approach. If identity management solutions are not properly implemented as part of NG911 services, then NG911 will be vulnerable to internal hackers with limited attribution and more vulnerable to accidental acts that disrupt services in a manner which may be undetected longer due to its unintentional nature. Um, ICAM service areas for consideration by PSAP and 911 authorities include digital identity, credentialing, privilege management, authentication, authorization and access, cryptography, and auditing and reporting. Uh, not enough can be said about ICAM. It's critical. Uh, let's move on now to cost models. So an important part of the Commission's assignment for the working group was to identify with some specificity the cost of implementing this EC3. So the report lays out in detail the rough order of magnitude estimate for operational expenses of a small to medium EC3. This would be supporting small and medium-sized PSAPs, would be approximately $1.3 million per year. A larger center capable of supporting multiple medium to large PSAPs with a great deal more traffic and real-time scanning and analysis would be approximately 2.5 million per year. So this assumes a center with really twice as many personnel as a small, medium EC3. Now included in these cost estimates are employee expenses, internet provisioning, live IP scanning, web application assessment services, and utilities, bandwidth and communications, annual rent and taxes. So it really is an attempt to capture the full cost for running a center. Um, but as the report makes clear, really, rather than suggesting that each of the more than 6,000 PSAPs in the United States be burdened with building and staffing such facilities, there is an opportunity to use core EC3s at various levels, regions within a state, state level, or regions comprised of multiple states and 911 authorities, and thus offer public safety both economies of scale and operational efficiencies. Um, a, the third point I want to mention here is that is the information sharing environment. So in the current environment, PSAPs perform multiple critical functions for their jurisdictions. Now, many of these functions are common across all lines of operation and regardless of locality. However, the ability to share information and intelligence in real time between multiple PSAPs, agencies, and jurisdictions has not been defined. So information sharing environment, or ISC, broadly refers to the people, projects, systems, agencies that enable responsible information sharing for national security. You know, sensitive but unclassified information is a cornerstone for decision making across ISC communities. And Working Group 1 has included a number of links to various ISC resources in Appendix A of the supplemental report. Now, the Working Group also um, put together a number of recommendations. Uh, this is the next slide, Sherry, sorry. And I can't go through all of these, time won't print it today, but a couple of them I do want to identify. So in the near term, um, the recommend, first recommendation is provide a funded pilot for the development and deployment of an EC3, including network and wireless wireline sensors and intrusion detection and prevention system functionality. The second recommendation is to encourage public safety communications community uh, to, to learn about and participate in the information sharing environments I just uh, mentioned. Um, a fifth recommendation is, and this is really important, uh, encourage 911 authorities to inventory their systems and participate in critical infrastructure cyber community voluntary program. You know, DHS launched this C3, as it's called, voluntary program to assist the enhancement of critical infrastructure cybersecurity and to encourage the adoption of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, you know, it's a voluntary program, it was created to help improve the resiliency of critical infrastructure, and it's definitely something you're, uh, you're, you're, you should look into. Um, in terms of midterm recommendations, um, develop a comprehensive plan or a roadmap for build out of an EC3 and or cybersecurity core to protect NG911 core services. And finally, I think the long-term recommendation, of course, would be to complete build out and deployment of EC3s on a national level and interconnect all PSAPs, public safety communication centers, EOCs, and potentially FirstNet. Um, 
let's move on now to slide five. Um, I want to make sure we cover uh, the material here. So, so the task force was also uh, um, charged with putting together a funding sustainment model. Um, you know, p the task force devoted considerable time to assessing the nation's ability to both you know, sustain the current 911 system and to pay for the transition to NG 911 systems. You know, the systems supporting today's emergency communications are over 48 years old. And, you know, they're lagging behind communications technology. It continues to evolve away from, you know, the circuit switch TDM environment into a more mobile array of internet protocol-based services. And this is a real challenge, but a, a tremendous opportunity for 911 communications. But the migration to Engine 911 is going to require significant financial resources to support existing services along with the cost of the transition itself. So the commission tasked the TFOPA to develop a funding sustainment model that could be used by state and 911 authorities to calculate their financial needs as they transition through various stages of the NG 911 development and implementation. Now, the task force used the NG911 maturity model that was developed in conjunction with the NG911 cost study currently underway by Lori's shop, the National 911 program. Um, as an initial matter, matter the, the T task force supplemental report provides a you know, broader description of the common costs that are incurred in the deployment of 911 and NG911 systems. So it provides decision makers with a firmer understanding of the nature of the costs and cost recovery. Um, it also dissects the historical and current cost elements of legacy 911 systems and the new cost elements incurred as these systems transition towards fully functional NG911 systems. Now, to properly frame these cost elements, the task force adopted many aspects of the National 911 Program Office's NG911 maturity model, you know, and part of that framework involves uh, you know, describing the effort in the sort of six domains, and they're not on your slide there, but they're, they're, they're revealed in great detail in the report. Um, and there's really six of them. There's the business domain, there's the data domain, their application and systems domain, the infrastructure domain, security domain, and the operations performance domain. So each of these is, you know, consists of their own set of categories and, and um, imperatives, if you will, um, and, and that goes to modeling how to, how to move forward. Um, if we look, and the report also looked at um, a comprehensive discussion of funding mechanisms and revenue sources. Uh, principle among TFOPA's recommendation is the need to review, revise, and potentially create new funding mechanisms that would help ensure the sufficiency of available 911 funds in the future. Um, the task force identified five options for state and local governments, uh, three of which include migration towards state universal service fee assessments, integrating NG911 into state sales and use taxes, and it even scoped out the network, uh, network connection fee on uses of broadband services. But in each case, the task force bias was really towards approaches that are technologically neutral and sustainable. Um, the report also lays out potential new mechanism with respect to federal grants, state grants, and it does get into some detail on the network connection fee. Um, but with respect to federal funding, it does make some straightforward recommendations, um, a few of which include conformance to open, non-proprietary and commercially available standards, um, an open, transparent, and competitive acquisition process, uh, development of a statewide plan and coordination with local authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some, some very uh, detailed uh, prescriptions in this, in this document for you to consider as you move forward. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, and this is important as well, the, the report includes a number of useful appendices that provide greater detail on current resource allocation and funding programs. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this, this table or spreadsheet captures the common cost categories that are described in detail throughout the supplemental report. You'll notice that the cost categories are defined by certain domains that I described before. Um, and so by applying this funding sustainment model to those cost components applicable to each domain and maturity stage of this maturity model, you know, state and local administrators can estimate the costs associated with each domain category. So rather quickly, you could determine whether or not sufficient funds can be expected to be available at each stage of, stage of deployment as your just jurisdiction transitions from legacy to end state and to one. Now, the table, of course, represents a high level accounting of the expected funding surplus or shortfall, but the, the component cost categories identified on the model should be broken down into greater levels of detail subject to the needs of each individual 911 authority. However, this, this table can serve as an important tool 
for 911 stakeholders as they work with decision makers at all levels to fully understand the financial aspects of moving towards 911. I mean, if you were to put this slide up in front of your decision maker, here is the snapshot. This is the stark reality of what your state or jurisdiction is confronting. So uh, we've discussed how to protect PSAPs now and as they transition to full NG911, and we discussed the mechanisms available for accounting for and planning to sustain these, in, this invaluable resource. Um, Steve Satter is now going to walk you through the NG911 readiness scorecard. This is a tool to provide 911 authorities and decision makers with a more granular understanding of essential NG911 system elements and enable those authorities and decision makers to assess where they lie on the NG911 implementation maturity continuum. Steve? Tim, good afternoon. And to my friends and colleagues online, both good afternoon or good morning as the case may be. Uh, before I get into the slides, there are a few other things that I'd like to mention, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, uh, I was fortunate to chair a group of a 40 plus or minus people that the commission had selected to serve on this task force. Uh, and at one of our earlier meetings, we collectively ran around the room and identified how many years of experience uh, my colleagues had in the public safety 911 world. And it came up to an incredible 900 plus years of experience. And I wanted to make mention of that, both to acknowledge that group of people, to thank them for their service, but to also let you that are participating in this webinar today have an appreciation of the breadth of knowledge that went into the production of this report. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity, while Tim's on the line with me, uh, to acknowledge the great support staff work that we had from the FCC. Uh, from the Commission as a whole, from the Chairman in particular, from the uh, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Tim in particular, who was our designated uh, officer to work with us. Each and every one of them was committed to 911. Uh, they did what good managers do. They kind of gave us the tasking and let us to go about doing the job. Uh, and I hope that what we have produced for them, and more particularly for you, the 911 community, uh, will serve you well in, in, the, in the future. I also like to acknowledge Sherry Griffin Powell. Uh, that was her voice that you heard at the very outset with a happy Valentine's Day. Sherry, thank you so much. Sherry is with Mission Critical Partners uh, and has been just a great facilitator uh, and go-to person as this uh, webinar was being produced. Uh, for those of you on the webinar, you should know two things. One, that my information is that the 280 plus people that have registered for this webinar are the greatest number of attendees that have registered for any of the webinars in the State of 911 series. So we made a little history today, guys. And also I'd like to identify and, and to acknowledge Lori Flaherty again. It is from her shop uh, that all of this emanated. She was not only a member of the task force, but has been a strong, strong champion, as each of you know, for the entire 911 community. And Lori, thank you so much for that. Uh, we are at slide number seven now. Uh, and it, where we are in that slide is really up at about the uh, uh, back one, if you would, Sherry. We are ab about uh, at that 11 or 12 o'clock mark where you say legacy need 911 selected routers and alley database. That's kind of where most of us are right now. Uh, there are a few of us, as you'll hear a little bit later when Dana uh, produce, uh, provide some information that are a little bit further downstream than that, but pretty much the rest of us are up there in that corner. So what both Tim has provided to us and what I will provide as we move towards the closure here is some of the things that both reinforce what Tim said and to give us some idea of the importance of the things that uh, lie ahead of us and the importance of of working together, not only amongst the, the 911 community, uh, but it is extraordinarily important uh, that we also branch out, if you will, and include in that community our elected and appointed officials, uh, our police chiefs, our sheriffs, our fire chiefs, our EMS directors, whomever it is that really makes up the total 911 community because it's important that one, they understand what we are about, the challenges that lie ahead and the importance of Next Gen 911, but they also can support it because they're aware of it and they understand the benefits that will be derived from it. So
So reach out uh, to groups that you may not normally deal with, and I would like to emphasize the one down there at about the 7 o'clock mark, the GIS people. Uh, if you're not uh, good buddies with your GIS people right now, you need to promise yourself that beginning at the end of this call, you'll begin to reach out to them. They have an incredibly important role in the implementation of NextGen 911. Uh, and they are extraordinarily skilled people, but I think sometimes they have not necessarily realized early on how important their skill sets are going to be uh, to the implementation of NextGen 911. I'd also like to draw your attention to about the 5 o'clock mark, where it says radio networks. We're not only talking about current land mobile radio, but we're also talking about broadband. When we think about broadband, we think about FirstNet and the incredible important role that both of them will have uh, in the future as we roll out 911. I'm going to move ahead to slide number eight now, which is your readiness scorecard. And as I think I heard Tim mention earlier, this is done as a self-guide for you and those that you work with and for to begin to really realize, you know, the task before you and to give you a means by which you can start in a structured way to travel that journey towards the conclusion and the implementation of NextGen 911. The number one item there that we have is governance. Uh, again, something that many frontline people, the heroes under the headset, uh, our call takers, our dispatchers, our typical supervisors and 911 directors and administrators don't necessarily always get involved with the governance of what they do. Uh, but it is incredibly important that they be aware of that uh, and they reach out and they form alliances both within their communities and in their adjacent communities. Uh, speaking for myself personally in the National Capital Region, we have a very, very active region-wide 911 Directors uh, Committee. Uh, they work very, very closely. As we look at NextGen 911, not only as a local issue uh, for a particular community or a particular PSAP, but more importantly, for a larger scale, broader implementation uh, across the entire two-state District of Columbia, 12 counties, seven city, serving five million people implementation. My screen went blank, but I want to be sure that I'm still being heard. Can somebody acknowledge that uh, I'm still online? Yes, you, you we are. can still hear you. Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Just wanted to do a reality check there. Uh, <laughs> I also want to move now on to slide number nine. Uh, this is not to be confused with the, the scorecard per se, but it is intended to give you a roadmap. Uh, if you look at the chart at the bottom uh, right-hand side where we begin with legacy and we move through the six steps towards implementation at a national st end state, realize that most of us are back there at step number one. And the whole purpose of this document uh, was to take us to step number two, three, four, and five, and ultimately six in a very structured way uh, so that we don't miss anything along the way uh, and that the end product of what we do at some point in the future, and obviously the sooner the better, uh, is one that we can all be proud of and most importantly that our communities and our nation are well served by. On slide number 10, Sherry, uh, again, we're going to reemphasize some of the things that both Tim and I spoke about earlier. The governance I have highlighted on my hard copy, can't speak too highly about that. Very, very important. There has to be a way of, of governing how we're going to both communicate, how we're going to route calls, how we're going to cost share, how we're going to most efficiently and most effectively implement. And you don't do that in a vacuum. You do that by reaching out and forming alliances with your neighbors and other agencies within your particular government structure. Uh, that all have a part of this. Uh, when we talk about the network, about the fifth bullet down, we're talking about ESINET, of course, uh, a, a term that is no longer foreign to our vocabulary, but it's a term that is still new to our vocabulary. Very, very important. Uh, we go down two more to security. Uh, I like to refer to this as 911 security or 911 cyber security because I don't want any of our uh, non-911 personnel that are part of our partnership here, mainly our electeds or our IT people or our appointed officials, to think of security and say, well, uh, Apple has this under control or uh, Google is taking care of that or the phone company will take care of that. 
No, no, no. It is a security that we are responsible for, the 911 community, and that's something that we've never really had a need to do before we, because we were always dependent before on hardwire networks and vendors that provided that service uh, to us. Uh, and I would like to add one bullet to this, uh, to this uh, number 10 slide, and it's down at the bottom, and that is to engage your 911 call takers, your dispatchers, uh, your supervisors, your managers, and your directors. They are the front line, and it is incredibly important that they be part of this process to understand what it's all about and that we as managers or whatever roles our may be, listen to their interests, listen to their concerns, uh, take all of that into consideration as we move forward. Uh, I'm now at slide number 11, Sherry, thank you. Uh, again, a reiteration of some of the things that you've heard us speak about. Uh, this is particularly as it applies to GIS. I hope there were some GIS people on our, on our call today. Uh, your role is absolutely incredibly important. Generally speaking, uh, the role of GIS and public safety in the past has been to take a unit from a point on the map and take them to a point of an event. Uh, GIS is much, much more than that in the next generation 911 world. So uh, to our GIS partners, uh, buckle up because it's going to be a big ride uh, and we're very, very heavily dependent upon you. Uh, the final slide is number 12. It is somewhat self-explanatory. Educate and engage. I think both Tim and I have spoken to that. Plan, smart planning. We have an opportunity today that we didn't have before. Uh, it wasn't mentioned at the outset, but let me mention it now. Today, the, sixth, the 14th day of February is but two days away, two days away from the 49th anniversary of the first 911 call that was made in Haleysville, Alabama. Back then, in those years, 49 years ago, we didn't have roadmaps, we didn't have guidelines, we didn't have FCC reports to help us. We kind of stumbled along in many ways. Uh, the world that we're now in uh, does not allow for that, uh, and instead it provides for a strong, structured way that we can move from point A to point B, uh, and all of those things are captured in these educate and engage, plan, coordinate, and to demonstrate as we move through the EC3 concept. Uh, and lastly, and Tim, I think, referred to it, and let me do it as well. For those of you on the call, this is documents, these are documents that it's incredibly important that you access, and don't do a casual read. Quite frankly, it can be a heavy read, and there will be to you as there was to me, even as closely engaged as I was as the product uh, reached closure, um, there are a lot of terms that are foreign to us uh, and whoever us are, uh, but it's very important that we have a good working knowledge of all of these documents because it will really allow us to, with a measure of confidence and, uh, and, and, and structure, move forward as we, as we move forward to the implementation of NextGen 911. So with that, I will say thank you very much, and I will turn it back to Sherry Powell. Okay, thank you. So I believe um, Sheila is collecting questions. Uh, this is our Q&A time. Uh, as we mentioned, it, you can either use the raise hand function or type your question into the chat window. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, we do have some questions here. Our first one is, are there any PSAPs using the EC3 today? If not, are there commercial users of such a solution? Uh, so this is Tim. Um, no, I don't believe that at present there are any using it or have an EC3 as conceptualized in this report um, in place. But as I mentioned at the outset, you know, a lot of the elements or the, the structures, if you will, of an EC3 are borrowable, if you if you will. Um, there are there may be state, there may be federal entities and functionalities that can be leveraged towards creation of that EC3, either at the state or regional, what have you level. Thank you, um, Steve or Tim. Could you remind the listeners again what GIS stands for? Tim, I'll take that. Uh, geographical 
information systems, mapping, if you will, mapping to a level of specificity that, again, in public safety was in the past not as critical as it is today. Uh, the center line concept of a center of a street line and what side of that street is the appropriate location for a, uh, a response to be uh, sent to or a call was being received from is very, very critical. Generally speaking, we have not needed that level of specificity in the past. Uh, but in the future, we certainly will, which is why I say again, uh, um, get next to your, your GIS people, get to know them uh, and understand what they do and help them understand what we do and the critical importance of what they will do in the future to make Next Gen 911 a reality. Thank you, Steve. Um, will, there, will there be another round of Chief OPA work? So this is Tim, and I'll take that question. Um, so the task force was not rechartered heading into 2017, and a fu function of that was the was the transition in Washington. Um, but nevertheless, the issues, the work, the questions, they remain. And so I, I think whether whether the FCC puts together a another uh, group of specialists or it's under some other auspices. Um, you know, that, that, could be, that kind of work could be picked up. Um, but I will, say, I will say again, these reports, the final report, the consolidated report, and the supplemental reports, there's a tremendous body of knowledge here ready for exploitation. And I, I cannot emphasize enough that, there, you know, enough with the study groups perhaps, let's get reading and let's start implementing. Thank you, Tim. Um, our next question is a two-part question. To whom are the recommendations to form these EC3 facilities being directed, and who do you envision as a lead for these sites? So again, this is Tim. I'll, I'll take that. So again, I, I think the recommendations are directed towards towards the public safety community primarily. I mean, this is this is your responsibility, as Steve mentioned. You know, it has to be PSAP's responsibility to ensure that their facilities are secure. And today, that means many, many things. However, it's a particularly costly prospect. So really what this concept does is it, it, it describes a way to share available resources, develop uh, defined resources that are particular to PSAPs, uh, and, and move forward in that regard. So I think that's, you know, that, that's, that's really the core recommendation with, with respect to the, to the concept. What was the second part of that, Sherry? Um, the second part of the question was, who do you envision as the lead for these sites? I don't think there's a there's a it's not one partisan. This has to be a a group effort, if you will. And, and you know, you're gonna you're gonna involve your CI your state CIO. You're gonna involve your county CIO. You're gonna involve the guy who knows as much about cyber as anybody at the PSAP level. He may not know enough. So there's a huge education and training aspect to this as well. But it must be done. I mean, there's, there's, and Steve, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I, again, we can't emphasize this enough. This, this is a cru crucial foundation for ensuring NG911. I do want to add to that, Tim, uh, if you could, and that would be the chief financial officer or the budget oh, people within your agency. Uh, it's just very, very important uh, that they be aware of what is going on and the costs associated with it. There's nothing worse than to to just spec out a CAD system or whatever it may be and then go to finance and say, this is what it's going to cost, and they're going to say, well, why, how come, you know, isn't there a cheaper way of doing it, and blah, blah, blah. And it's very important that they understand, recognize, and appreciate um, the costs associated with this so that they are part of the solution and not somebody that simply inadvertently becomes a challenge to, to bring up the speed, if you will. So get those folks involved early on. Uh, let them know what is happening, and also let them know there is going to be a period of time during the implementation when you're really going to be maintaining two systems. You're going to be maintaining your legacy system while your new system, i.e., uh, your ESINet system, is being installed. So it's another kind of a dual-cost facet of this that if we do it smartly and well will not last long, but nevertheless it's something they need to be keenly aware of. 
Thank you, Steve. Um, our last question that we have posted here, when will the FCC require carriers to pass PIDF flow? Well, um, at, at present, uh, I mean, that's, that. this is Tim, this is, that's not, um, again, I, I think that to the extent that a carrier wants to, is prepared to offer that and, as, and a PSAP is prepared to accept it, that that's the that's the, the question. But at present, there's no. If you're asking if there's a rule or requirement specifically on that, no. But the question is, what is necessary to ensure the end-to-end -end functionality of the 911 system? As PSAPs roll out these capabilities to bring in that kind of information and leverage it, then the question is pressed, and people should have answers as to why they're not delivering that level of information into a capable PSAP. Okay, thank you, um, both Steve and Tim. I just want to make a note that I know we've run a little bit over so far, but don't worry, we will allow Dana and Jason their full 30 minutes, so we will just have um, a little bit longer than usual webinar today. And with that, Lori, I'm going to turn it back over to you to introduce our next speakers. Thanks, Sherry. So one of the roles of the National 911 program is to bring the community together to decide for itself how to move forward on specific issues. And I don't know, maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, I approached the state 911 administrators in four states in the upper Midwest, you can see them pictured here, and I asked them, you know, is it time to start talking about interstate issues? And these folks are sort of at varying levels of deployment, but had all started thinking about interconnecting their 911 systems. I will tell you that by the end of the day, not only did they say yes, but they had uh, set up the first call, and we've been trying to keep up with them ever since. Um, this is a group of people who are looking at the issues related to connecting their 911 systems. Um, they have just released their first chapter, if you will, of the interstate playbook and are already looking at the next two chapters. Uh, so, uh, again, trying to keep up with them has been a really interesting challenge. Uh, the two people who are on the webinar today are Dana Wahlberg, Dana Wahlberg and Jason Horning. Um, Dana is the 911 Program Manager for the State of Minnesota's Department of Public Safety, and Jason is the NG911 Program Manager at the North Dakota Association of Counties. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lori. And on behalf of all four of us, as uh, the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa team, I want to start by thanking um, Lori and her um, office for giving us this opportunity because it's really helped us not only um, learn and understand each other's environments a little bit more, but it has um, improved the service that we're now able to offer our citizens in our respective states. So uh, one of the first challenges we had when we started out was um, understanding where each of our four respective states was with the next generation 911 deployment. We were all going in slightly different directions. At that time, we, there really wasn't a blueprint or a roadmap to follow. Now we've got that TOFOPA body of knowledge that we can draw on and learn from, and that's something that we're going to start to put first and foremost in our future plans. But um, up until that came out, we were kind of punting on our own. And realizing that um, we were each taking a little slightly different approach to deployment, we first decided that we needed to identify similarities and differences in how we were operating, and then to be able to prioritize the initiatives that we identified and be able to capitalize on those initiatives that we thought would actually be most plausible and result yielding for not only our PSAPs, but for the citizens that each of those serve. We were looking for some immediate benefit to keep our, our stakeholders engaged. And so in order to do that, we kind of took it step by step. And, you know, what's the purpose? What are we trying to accomplish here? And, you know, that and understanding our current environments, understanding what our challenges are, for example, Minnesota and North Dakota are um, served by CenturyLink and West on the 911 service provider platform, and South Dakota and Iowa are supported by ComTech. Minnesota had an ESINET in place and was delivering 
wireline wireless and VoIP calls on that. Um, North Dakota was just a little bit behind us. Iowa had an ESINET for wireless calls, and South Dakota was just signing a contract with Comtech to provide their ESINET. So we were all in different places. So um, Lori's team provided us with professional and technical support through Mission Critical Partners. And they have not only served as technical subject matter experts, but they've been going about all of the meeting scheduling and really just providing A to Z support for each one of these initiatives and documenting the same. So they've actually been the scribes that have um, presented Chapter 1 of the, of the playbook. So we've been really grateful for their support and participation. So um, after identifying our respective environments, we would wanted to identify some use cases. And this was really easy because we just went to the PSAPs along our respective borders and said, hey, guys, what are your challenges? What do you need help with? What are things, if you could have something fixed, what would that be? So then we, we took all of those suggestions, and, and starting with the end in mind, we went on to um, creating what was our goal and how are we going to get there. So next slide, please, Sherry. So in looking at the goal, we really decided that we had um, two pieces of a goal. First, the long-range goal, which is going to take a long time to achieve because all of our states are not moving at the same pace or at the same speed. But the end result is that we want to be able to work across state boundaries using multiple network and database vendors for wireline, wireless, and VoIP calls, and receive callback and location information with those. So keeping that in mind, um, we knew that it was going to be a long time before we could get to that, and we'd be um, working on the playbook for a very long time. So we decided to start looking at an interim transitional approach. What can we do now? What can we do? with the status quo environment and, and how can we achieve some progress um, and still keep in mind the long-term roadmap to a full I-3 uh, end state. So we um, then identified that, you know, we can have all of these desires to make things happen, but we need to have the support of our vendors to really bring that technological and um, engineering expertise to the table to help us um, achieve what we want to achieve. So about that time, um, we decided that Chapter 1 was going to be uh, Minnesota and North Dakota and the challenge of wireless transfers with Annie and Allie across our state boundaries. And that was one of the issues that um, PSAPs all along the, bo the borders had identified as a challenge. So at that point, um, we really came to a realization. And Sherry, if we can go to the next slide, please. We identified, um, you know, the crux of what we'd been tasked to do was um, look at ways that we can become more interoperable. Interoperability being the baseline to a NINA I3 end state, and that these um, implementation of interfaces between states or regions is not as easy as just establishing connectivity and, and flipping a switch, that it requires engineering, design, testing, and all of um, this interactive work between disparate systems or even between somewhat similar systems in order to be able to fully interface. So I think I can't um, overstate the need for 911 vendor support in this. And after about our third or fourth call, we decided that it was imperative that we get our vendors engaged and have support from them. So for Minnesota and North Dakota, that meant CenturyLink as our 911 service provider, um, West as our database support coordination, and then because the state of Minnesota receives database support from two different um, services, um, West and also uh, Data Master using Independent Emergency Services, or IES, we needed to engage them as well because all of the PSAPs on our western border are IES-supported PSAPs, so we needed to include them in the discussion. Next slide, please. 
So the first thing that we realized that we needed to do was to create some kind of a formal agreement. You know, Jason and I kind of sat back and thought, well, we don't need to waste time with that. We can just get to the point and, and get moving with it. But then we started to realize that he and I aren't always going to be here, and we need to have some kind of a historical record of, of what's um, happening. Um, we'd like to have a legally binding agreement something that describes really how the states will work cooperatively together. If there's um, any type of um, dispute, what's the resolution process for that? Um, knowing that now we're working with uh, a database uh, from West and North Dakota, West and Minnesota, and also IES in Minnesota, we have to think about a true-up process. We need to keep all of those databases in line and and synced. So, you know, we just started to think about more and more of these types of things. And then what about cost? Um, are there any financial obligations? And if so, how are they going to be allocated between and amongst the partners on this initiative? Although our approach so far, um, or our philosophy for that, is that all of the vendors that we've asked to be engaged in this really have a huge opportunity. They've got a very captive audience. They have the National 911 office supporting this. They have professional and technical support from subject matter experts within Mission Critical Partners. And they've got four states that are willing volunteers all the way from the administrative level all the way down to the, the PSAP level. So there's a huge audience here and, and um, willing, willing worker bees. And um, Jason and I, I think, can speak for um, West that, and CenturyLink. They have been very helpful and willing to provide the engineering resources that we have needed to affect some of the interoperability between our states. Um, and I think it, it's important here to also recognize that what we're doing is not just for ourselves. It's, it's actually going to be a solution that other states that are, are, are going to be able to emulate with their neighbors or with their regions. So this isn't something that, that is self-serving. It's something that is going to be shared. And the whole um, the goal is that all of the conditions that we spell out, the terms and agreements that we create, all of these are going to become templates that will be um, accessible for other PSAPs and counties and states and regions to use in the future. And all of the understandings that we've um, realized through our, our phone calls have been formalized in writing, who's going to do what and when, and all of the responsibilities are laid out. So if nothing else, it's just going to be a good basic user guide for others to read and understand as they are exploring similar initiatives going forward. So Sherry, if we could go to the last slide now. Um, one of the things that um, we had identified as, as a goal is being able to accomplish as much of the work and clearly vet out the process prior to engaging the PSAPs. I mean, initially we solicited challenges from them, asked them what they identified as priorities for being able to improve the way they were doing business, but then we left them alone until we were quite certain that we had both a, a solid solution and a streamlined implementation for that solution. Knowing that there's always limited resources within the PSAPs um, for interaction with development of a process, um, we wanted to make sure that we had a very clear and succinct step-by-step -step repeatable mop to go through when we were actually ready to test and turn up. So in working with um, MCP and our vendors and um, the states, we basically confirmed the capabilities of the wireless carriers. We um, created a test plan of all of the combinations of carriers and um, potential counties on each side of the border that would need to be tested. And then we provided the notice to the PSAPs that we were um, let it, we basically let them know what we had done up to this point and let them know that we were ready to test. And Mission Critical Partners took the lead in that testing, and Minnesota and North Dakota each provided a tester and four wireless phones, one from each of the major carriers, and we sent our testers out, and they actually traveled and placed the test calls and 
we had immediate success and the solution has been in place for over a year now and our PSAPs have been very um, encouraged by it. They've identified call times taking um, less amount of time based upon them having Allie and Annie to work with and it's just been a good relationship building ex experience between our North Dakota and Minnesota PSAPs. So with that, I will turn over um, the rest of the presentation to my colleague, Jason, to talk more specifically about the rollout. Well, thank you, Dana. Uh, good afternoon or morning to, to you all. Um, if we could go, go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Jason, they're oh. moving up for us. I, oh, I think. sorry. Yeah, go ahead and go back one. So I'll, I'll take the second half of the presentation and talk a little bit about some of the things we've done thus far between North Dakota and Minnesota and how it might be helpful to other states as it relates to state-to-state -state interconnectivity. Uh, what you see on this slide is essentially what Minnesota's and North Dakota's 911 systems look like before we began implementation of what's been referred to as our Chapter 1 as you can see, these systems and ESINETs operated basically in isolation from one another. From a telecommunications perspective, the one thing in common between the two states at this point was that both, both PSAPs used the PSTN for their administrative lines, and it was across those lines that transferred 911 calls were sent and received prior to our deployment. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So because Minnesota and North Dakota had a common NG911 system provider, we imagine it should be possible for calls to be transferred across state lines. Previously, each state's selective routers had switched calls to the proper PSAF, but because we believe the calls were now being routed to a common uh, IP selective router, we imagine the IP selective router was, was well aware of the other state's PSAFs. So after some discussions and an agreement, Minnesota and North Dakota worked with CenturyLink and West to construct a virtual bridge between North Dakota's ESINET and Minnesota's ESINET. This bridge essentially made possible the transfer of calls from PSAPs in Minnesota to North Dakota and, and vice versa. Next slide, please. So the question is, what do we, we get out of this bridge? Well, for one thing, since calls are no longer being transferred on administrative lines, the receiving PSAP can now receive the location calls or receive, receive the calls on the priority lines along with location information that helps optimize the call taker's workflow and reduce response times overall. To make these transfers possible, we've been provided with an ability to use the three-digit star codes in either state. So it's not just that we're passing calls back and forth across PSAPs that are adjacent to one another. In some cases, it's necessary for PSAPs in Minnesota to route calls all the way to our state's capital in Bismarck, which is over 200 miles from the North Dakota-Minnesota border. There are similar cases with North Dakota's PSAPs needing to transfer 911 calls to Minnesota State Police, which are interior to, to their state. With the kind of exchange capabilities we've been able to implement, we also believe that there are some really interesting opportunities for our states to collaborate and work to improve 911 service in the region. We believe the benefits of Alley and true 911 call transfers are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the efficiencies that can be realized with this level of integration. Next slide, please. So what were some of the challenges during, our, during the implementation? Well, for one, we needed to have CPE vendors involved to program new buttons for the PSAPs. Um, while, while this may seem simple for some of you larger PSAPs on the line in rural communities, the PSAPs rely heavily on their vendors to perform that work, so, so that needed to be coordinated. Next, we realized in the testing phases, phases that wireless call transfers were being transferred to Minnesota without the receiving PSAPs ability to access Alley. The fix for this was that we needed to work with a local company called IES that, that Dana alluded to to provision new North Dakota p records into that Minnesota PSAP's IES-based alley system so that wireless and VoIP alley requests would be properly steered on to uh, the common uh, 911 database provider in West. I think the group also learned the importance of having two on-site pro uh, project technicians during testing that was imperative to make sure that, that each of the PSAPs was receiving text calls or re receiving uh, the calls and with location um, a on both sides. And then lastly, what the, the big question. So what happens if one state decides to go in a completely different direction? 
Uh, well, in, in my opinion, I suspect our PSAPs are going to be very reluctant to go back to the old days. So we're going to have to make sure that this type of interconnectivity is required as part of any RFP on a go-forward basis. We, we simply won't be able to, to go backwards. Next slide, please. So reflecting back on the accomplishments of, of the, the things that we did in Chapter 1, well, while the integration couldn't be considered an end-state I3 implementation, we think the work proved out some of the benefits associated with the vision of a network of networks. It also helped break down some of the technical and operational limits associated with our state boundaries. Our systems are no longer operating as two independent islands. They're now connected by a bridge that makes a lot of things possible, both in the near term and in the long term. While we think the N-State I-3 is certainly a goal that our states will continue to pursue, <clears throat> we felt that as long as the work to do was not significantly time-consuming, that there was value in leveraging the possibilities associated with our state's transitional NG and island systems. I think it's generally true of all the states that are part of this playbook initiative and most across the country that we all have a significant amount of work to do to get our GIS houses in order before we can reasonably expect our vendors to implement an N-State I-3 system. Speaking for myself, it's because of that reality that I believe the work we've done uh, here has, has merit and it has value in the near term. Next slide, please. And so our work isn't yet complete. Um, we do have two additional initiatives in the works. Uh, we have wireless call transfers between Iowa and Minnesota, uh, as well as the exchange of SMS messages between North Dakota and Minnesota. Next slide, please. So in this, slide, in this slide, you see a new state, um, ComTech, and a new vendor in the mix. Um, discussions are already underway to make the exchange of wireless calls between Iowa's ComTech-based 9-1 system and the West-based system, uh, the West-based 9 system in, North, in Minnesota. Um, additionally, this will help insulate somewhat the potential for breaking connections should one state decide to go in another direction, as was alluded to earlier, even though we, we understand that there are, are, are a number of service providers in the industry that can um, provide these kinds of services. Next slide, please. In addition, we intend to use the bridge we've con already constructed between North Dakota and Minnesota to allow for the exchange of SMS text from North Dakota to Minnesota and vice versa. The routing of SMS text is a bit different and we're dealing with a very new type of media, so the work is a little bit more complicated than, vo than voice, but we believe it's a worthy and achievable goal. Next slide, please. So to kind of wrap this up, um, as, you, as you might expect, there were a number of steps involved in the first chapter of the Interstate Playbook's efforts. Uh, we were, as, as Dana mentioned, we were very lucky to have Mission Critical proactively involved in all aspects of the initiative to make sure that everything we did as states was well documented for future use by states or regions looking for a bit more integration with one another. Um, Lori had mentioned that um, that we were we were pushing ahead, and uh, in in some regards we we kind of had to be slowed down a little bit and and told to go slower because uh, um, you know we we simply from Dan and, and my perspective wanted to get these services out to the PSEPs and the public because we knew how important they were. Um, but we, we were always then reminded, too, that we, we needed to slow down a little bit so that the process could be documented. Um, we're also very fortunate to, as Dana mentioned, have uh, vendors who are willing to help us move that 9-1 community a little further ahead and reach an important milestone. So with that, I would encourage you all to visit the URL towards the bottom of this slide and learn more about all the plays that, uh, that we made as we went through uh, Chapter 1. And with that, I'll hand it back to Sherry. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I was uh, losing my voice there. On this slide, we have the contact information for all four of the participants. We will now start the QA portion of this session. And again, you can use the chat or raise hand features. Thank you, Sherry. Our first question, at what point of the deployment process do you recommend engaging with your vendor on this compatibility? After deployment is complete, prior to deployment, or as early as procurement? Well, this okay. is Dana, and I, I guess I can start by saying I don't think it's too early to start. Um, it may be it may be that you want to even include some language in your RFP that you have an expectation of your vendor to start to um, do some of this. 
depending on the vendor, we did not experience any reluctance on the part of West to pursue what we've wanted to do, but I, I'm not familiar with the other vendors, so I don't know if, if they would all be as forthcoming. I really do think that, that to some degree they need to have a little bit of a prod to encourage them to, to take that next step outside of the box and, and start to um, work towards more interoperability. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, what was the impact to the PSAPs who participated in the testing? Did testing impact operations? And do you foresee any changes to the level of impact in future interstate playbook testing? I can try and take that one. Um, there was an impact a little bit on the front end of this because we, we did have to have technicians involved um, and, and go out to those 911 centers and, and perform testing uh, to make sure that the calls were being delivered on, on trunks, uh, to make sure alley was being received. Um, so there, there was some impact in terms of, uh, you know, the, the testing phase, but I think the long-term goal, um, you know, gen definitely outweighed that minor, uh, that minor inconvenience. Um, by having the ability to bring location information directly into their center, they have the ability to automatically map calls, map wireless calls um, in particular, uh, to know where, where the call is calling from. So uh, they can determine whether that call is theirs or it needs to be transferred and, and generally reduce the, the amount of time it takes to respond to the incident. Thank you. Our next question is, were there any unexpected hurdles that you had to go through? Well, I, suppose, I think, go ahead. go ahead, Jason. I was just going to mention, I mentioned it in the, um, in the presentation as well, the, the unexpected hurdle um, that, that we ran into, or at least from my perspective we ran into, was the, um, the need to provision the peony records for steering at a local level uh, in Minnesota as, as we went into this, we, we sort of thought, well, you know, well, West is providing the alley for wireless, uh, and that's true, um, but to get those calls to West so they can respond with an alley, we needed to insert new p records into local alley databases um, that were supporting those um, PSAPs along the Minnesota border. So that was, an, that, for me, that was an unexpected um, thing. I guess I should have expected it, but I didn't see it coming. I don't know if, Dana, you have anything else to add to that? No, well, I think along that same line is to make sure that we have a process going forward for uh, reconciling that, and, and we're looking at doing that every six months as part of our, um, our alley reconciliation, just to make sure that there maybe aren't new ones added on the North Dakota side or vice versa, that we don't alert our, our neighbors for so that um, things start to decline. I, and one other thing I'll mention is we had initially thought that we would just use phones that maybe um, the dispatchers had in the PSAP to do the test calling, and then we realized that that just wasn't um, a good shortcut. So we actually went out and purchased prepaid phones from um, the four major service providers, and and that worked well so that we didn't have to be um, – trying to track down Sprint phones or T-Mobile phones or whatever, that we actually, our testers actually had the the four phones and it, it expedited things. But I, I think just communicating with the PSAPs, letting them know, hey, we're really trying to do something here that's going to make life easier for you. Don't over-engage them in the beginning of the process, but when it's actually time, um, and that's kind of what we did is we, Every once in a while, we'd shoot them an email and let them know where we were and making progress. So they were kind of anticipating that we were getting closer. And then, so then when we did announce that we were ready to test it, we felt it was going to be a successful deployment. They were really excited and really pleased with, with how the testing um, turned out. Okay. The next question is, how and where are wireless calls, TDM, converted to IP? I can try and answer that um, that question. Um, I believe Minnesota is the same as North Dakota in the sense that we have legacy network gateways 
um, that are actually out of state. Um, so here at, in North Dakota, at least, we, we still use our legacy select router, um, but that legacy select router is now steering basically every single call towards an LNG, which, which in turn connects up with uh, West's ECMC uh, system uh, in, in Florida and in Colorado. Uh, and it's at that point, at the LNG point, where the, the TDM uh, signals would be turned into IP signals. And that okay. would be the same for Minnesota. Our, our legacy network gateways are in the state, but um, we are communicating with the West IP selective routers in Longmont and in Miami. Thank you. Could you explain the term star codes and describe the role they played in your interstate effort? Sure. Um, a star code is really just a speed dial that's associated with the, um, I guess, the routing DN, if you will, um, associated with the 911 trunk in in the in the PSAP that you want to transfer to. Um, CenturyLink has pre-built three-digit star codes that are associated with every Minnesota PSAP and with every North Dakota PSAP, and they're unique. So um, when, when a PSAP um, initiates a three-digit star code in their CPE, the call automatically transfers from their 911 trunks over to the 911 trunks in the recipient PSAP, and the call displays on a 911 trunk with Annie and Allie. Okay, thank you. Our last question for today is a two-part question. Do you have any border PSAPs that answer calls, including landline calls, from both states? And the second part, if so, can you talk about how they have dealt with the issues in the past? Um, I, can, I can start with that. Um, we actually do have one PSAP. Um, in North Dakota that, that receives wireless calls from Minnesota, but also receives landline calls from Minnesota. And that's because their exchange slightly um, goes over the, the border of North Dakota, Minnesota. Um, in, and this actually came up as, a, as an issue in, uh, recently. Um, and it was sort of the, the, the motivation to get involved in this particular program, at least from my perspective. Um, Right now, there is no uh, short-term plan to to change the way that that works because it would involve selective router or, or legacy selective router to legacy selective router interconnectivity, which would come as an, a new cost. Um, but this particular PSAP is an unenhanced PSAP, so we don't have uh, an understanding of the division in terms of the MSEG. And so longer term, as we, we get to that 9-1 center and we start to build out a out an MSEG for them through the use of their GIS, um, we'll be um, directing that carrier who has bleed over exchange territory uh, to send the records in, um, you know, the, the North Dakota records in towards the North Dakota uh, database and, and the same on the other side, which should clean out the, the routing of the landline call issue. Um, the wireless call issue, I, I think we are going to have, at least for some time still, that you know, you have to make an assignment to the, the, the sector. Uh, it's got to go somewhere, and it's got to start somewhere. So for at least the, the near term, we, we still see those, uh, those things happening where a call uh, from an individual in Minnesota could be routed to North Dakota, um, and then we would need to route it back. And, and that's largely the problem that we were really trying to solve here um, through Chapter 1 is that happens every single day or very close to it, and so when we have those cases, we want to be able to transfer that call to the neighboring state and have them have the same visibility on the, on the call uh, as, as the initial receiving PSAP did. Um, that, that's only prudent um, to ensure that the, the, the public is, is provided the same level of service regardless of what state they're in. Okay. Um, I believe that concludes our questions. I want to thank all of our speakers, Mr. May, Mr. Souter, Ms. Wahlberg, and Mr. Horning, and ask Lori, do you have any closing remarks? I'd also like to thank Jason, Dana, Steve, and Tim for all sharing all of your experience and your expertise. Um, we're lucky to have you guys 
as part of our community. And thank you for sharing that today. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Well, that concludes today's webinar. We appreciate everyone's participation. An archived version of today's webinar will be available on 911.gov soon. And our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, April the 11th at noon Eastern Time. A complete listing of the webinar dates is provided. And this year, you will be able to register for all 2017 webinar dates at one time. Simply go to the web page and click on the checkbox in the upper left corner next to the date time header. Then click on the register button at the bottom left of the page. This will register you for all 2017 webinars. We hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you and have a great day.